Um, Oscar was the one who, who presented this idea. And he, he claims that he's got 22 points that he wants to talk about, <laughs> if I remember correctly. So this one could get really down deep in the weeds, uh, which should be interesting. All right, Oscar, kick us off. Yeah, before I start to talk about this, I have to say, I have to say about me just a few things that I, I used to work with in nine years with four coaches in national team of Poland. Then I was also a scoutman and an assistant coach uh, in Finland national team with Thomas Samelvua. Then I was working also in several clubs. So after this kind of experience as scout, many assistant coach and, and head coach, I, I prepare like some checklist, some uh, analysis protocol for how to, how to analyze setter work. And before we go to discussion, I have to say that it's a really, really far away being a scoutman and coach and before before i was thinking only like a scoutman now i'm thinking like a coach and in this in this case everything what you're gonna hear is like you have to do by yourself find a way to what is important for you because before i was really involved to the numbers now i'm more coaching and and thinking more globally and i think it does the also the the, the case that we're gonna discuss with mark a lot that some numbers are not so important, but I think it's good to pre to pre to create some protocol and checklist how to watch setter. Then we can just discuss also about spikers and all all around uh, all around the volleyball. But uh, as you said, my checklist is finally because for this uh, for this webinar, yes, 22, 22 uh, positions about uh, like checklists how plays well, uh, setter of my opponent team. So uh, I prepared like, first of we have to also start discussing this, this discussion, why we gonna, why we are doing this, this kind of things. So I, I believe that everybody knows that the speed of the volleyball is, is really high. And uh, every time when we have one man block, our possibility to, to make a break, it's, uh, it's really, really hard. So, watching, working with many, many coaches, we we decide to to play many options, commit a lot of time. But if you want to commit, you have to have a really, really good and study to 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 not play poker or something like that. You know, it's you have to, the really good plan has to be to, uh, based on on some facts and really good uh, good ideas. So, um, the first thing is always, I believe uh, you agree, it's a technique of the setter. If you have to watch the setter of our opponent team, it's that if he has some difficulties to, in, to, to run, for example, to position four or far away from the, from the court, it's always first point to check how good technically is this, this setter. Second thing is if his body position is giving you signals. But this is also really, really interesting. After many, many years, we were always showing during the video session that look, this setter when he's arcing spine, then he's setting back. And when I was talking with middle blockers, many, many really high-level middle blockers, they were always talking like, "Yes, in, during video I can see it, but I have to watch the ball. I have to watch setter." And it's not like that I, I can see everything what you said before. When I'm in defense position, then I can see everything clearly what you said. But during the game, it's really, really difficult to, to see it. So it's a, all the time, all the protocols are changing after I'm, I'm adding another thing which I'm discussing with another setter, every time having a new idea. So first is the technique. That's that's main point. Second, I... I put it on one global thing is like a base analysis is rotations, the like general rotation, general distribution, but always excluding rotation one, which is completely different uh, from, uh, from other positions. The many teams have uh, many difficulties in this rotation. So I'm, if I'm watching this, this main general statistics, like distribution of setter, it's excluded. Uh, I exclude. I exclude rotation one, but then 
These general rotations are based by two things. First, our base of the or setter call, like we used to uh, name it uh, in, uh, in Europe, but I think, well, how you gonna call it in, in US? The base, setter call, call, okay. So you know what I mean. Second is setter, setter position, from where is his setting, always dividing in these two, two main things. After, we are going a little bit more advanced. It's like, to uh, not lose everything, what I want to say, it's, I'm, I really like to use, to watch and study connected rotations, which means P6, P5 is like opposite front line, P4, P3, P2, opposite back row, P3, P2, when first outside hitter is front, P6, P5, P4, which is second outside hitter front, P5, P4, P3, when, is, when first middle is in front, P1, P6, P2, second middle front, and P6, P3, which is the rotation when middle blocker is coming from zone two. This, this is, the, this is the, like a basic analysis, these two main mm, subjects for basic analyze, uh, analysis protocol. I like connection, connections because, giving you an example, if you study and you see that there is a setter call seven and you know that there is no over seven, like over, overload to go, you call it. Then you have 50 to middle blocker and 50, 45 back. I never, I'm never happy with this kind of analysis. I want to know when he's setting uh, to the setter to the middle blocker and when he's setting the ball to the back. That's the my idea. So I'm looking. We, we, I'm looking the answer with which middle blocker he tends to play more or which with, uh, with which outside hitter he play over seven. That's really important. So that's why these connect, connected rotations are interesting for me. Then um, we are going to, let's say, uh, Spa, yes, sorry, I, this is a lot of st things to say, so, but the, mostly, most of the time, if you play against the teams, the, like in, you have in Plus Liga, like Mike, Mark uh, had many times that, for example, there are three outside hitters on the court, and coach is rotate, rotating them in different positions. So we create the worksheet, which is exactly with one outside hitter in front, or specific middle blocker in front or we, we are looking for specific rotation, which is really difficult during the season to find exactly the same rotation all the time, but you are, during 20, 25 games, you can, you can find it. So all these analyses are going also through this filter that I want to know exactly what, what is going on when setter, when the specific middle blocker is in front. Yeah, this is the basic. Then, it's coming from also from the technique that uh, we are always looking uh, some tendencies where from where was the where, from where is coming reception so from zone one zone six zone five and what is setter is going to do after short serve technique I already said but I, I told you that it's before uh, before I said that. Ability, um, setter body positions, what kind of signals he's giving, ability to see the block, it's also there are many setters that are watching, honestly I, sometimes I don't believe they see something, but there is a habit like the, that they, they are watching, maybe Mark will, will say, you will say me something about that, but I, I spoke with many setters and they said, no, I'm doing, deep, doing this because when I, have, when I was 15 years old, my coach said that I have to watch the net, and I stayed like this all my season, all my career, but I don't see nothing. Yeah. And uh, we create also some specific analysis, what is going to do setter with really flat ball, really high ball, high pass, and what is going to do with one set, one hand set. Every time we're using some specific code during inside the scout file, but this was also some interesting information that, for example, if you study the Checo, if he's one hand, you, can, you don't have any answer. But there are setters that are setting only four, 
or, or first tempo, then you can, you have numbers. What was really important, interesting when I was talking one day with Paolo Zagumne, he told me, have you ever checked difference, differences between uh, setter distribution when there is a float surf, and there is a spin surf? And I asked him why. And he said, because many float passers, they, they pass really flat ball. And then comes technique. And not every setter is able to manage this kind of ball the same, the same way. So we are also looking for this kind of information. Maybe so the distribution is changing by type of the, of the serve. For me, one of the most important, and I'm always watching a lot about, the, about this, is how setter is playing against block. Mostly is setter, I'm, I'm calling it setter versus block. I'm watching what kind of tendencies setter has against opponent setter and on the opposite, 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 sorry. That's the main idea that I'm always looking. Even if I don't have an answer, like he's playing always, always, always over setter, then I know that this is not the idea of the play, of the, of the setting. There is something different. But block versus setter versus block is really, really important to me. Also, I'm watching distribution against outside hitters and middle blockers. But this is kind of trap because you have to know really good opposite middle blocker, what kind of weak points, what kind of really good things he's doing. So we have to first study middle blockers, then you have to study setter and then you are going to the trap that you have too many informations and you don't understand really well the game that, that what is going on this is the thing that i'm really i'm really focused about when we are playing fifth six seven game against this team what he's going to do against my middle blocker which i know really really good that's the exact for example this season i in switzerland i had we had five let's say consecutive games against lutheran and then I was studying a lot uh, what kind of uh, tendencies this, kind, this setter had against my middle blocker. After. Um, there is like, let's say, advanced analysis, which I'm using also, what kind of uh, distribution we have. If outside hitter front line is receiving, if he's getting ball to spike, what especially what is, going, what is happening if there's short surf and he's uh, in the less deep launch, if there's some kind of tendency. In P1 also, of course, there's a different. And really important to me, it's if there's a pipe after uh, reception. If they play pipe, if the player back row is playing, is passing the ball. What is happening against uh, when set a middle blocker receives short serve and in these days also I'm, I'm analyzing when opposite is like in the fourth one uh, in the in the pass line if he's passing the ball now I'm watching also if he's getting the ball for example Maxim Mikhailov for him there is no problem to go to the spy but there are let's say not so technically good opposites they are receiving now so sometimes I'm using also tactically serve to the to this uh, to this opposite just to know that he will not spike and we we can use kind of tactic transition let's say for women's volleyball for sure is more important for me the most important uh, questions are always main spikers then uh, if there is first tempo and pipe what is going on after free ball pass or really easy defense? And the extra thing when I'm, uh, when what I'm watching and scouting is what is going on because now we, in the modern volleyball we have also a lot of let's say easy solutions. If you don't have a good ball, you tip you tip to the opposite. So I'm scouting also this kind of situation if the ball is going back. That's some um, the easy this easy answer. But I would like to know if I tip. If I can, I go overload four. Let's say. And the thing that I'm, I think last, let's say, ten years, I'm talking about it 
with many, many scout men's coaches, and I still, I think I'm really far from there, is the category game rhythm. I would like to know really exa exactly about the rhythm of the game and the, what is changing during the game in the head of the, of the setter. So first, the famous repetitions, what the setter is doing after block, or error of his spiker, if he's repeating the same ball, or what kind of solutions, for example, our big friend Miguel Falasca, I, I remember he was always playing, if there was a block, opposite was blocked, over every time the ball was in four, he was changing the side. Like the first choice was always the river side, let's say. The thing that I really like to watch is correlation first tempo pipe, how the setter is managing these two kind of balls. In this year, in this season I, in Switzerland, I had one setter who was playing like this. He never starts the set and game with first tempo. He was playing all the time two balls to zone six. Then when he knew that now my, middle, my opponent middle blocker will wait for pipe, now I'm playing first tempo. This thing I'm watching a lot the, the, like, what kind of managing of these two, two balls the setter likes to use. After many years, I discovered also that you can find really good answers about the setter, uh, setter tendencies, dividing first side out from second side out, third side out. Because First side out is like the easiest way to manage for setter. But when there is a more pressure that you have to score the ball, ball then second side out start, starts to be really important. Third side out, consecutive side out, is to like the main player. So I'm also separating side outs. Only taking first, then only seconds, only third side outs. And then there you have clear numbers that every time the balance is changing. In the first side out, you can see many variations of, of numbers, but in the first side out, there is a big tendency. What I really like in, uh, in uh, your, up, your up mark, and I'm now thinking really, really how to use it in data volley is this game by game, which means that you can see that in a, if you, there is a setter that he has tendency to play 40% first tempo, but one game he has 50, one game he's 20. And you, with these dots, I really like it. And I said it's impressive because that's a really easy way to read it uh, from this, this picture, this diagram. But I was looking by, by like watching game by game. Ah, this game. For example, against your team, my team will play all the time first tempo because you are using the read mode. But in the night, like you, you don't commit a lot. So in this okay. case, exactly. So in this case, don't, don't tell anybody. It's <laughs> just thirty-one person <laughs> attend this. <laughs> yeah, but like giving an example against you, my team will have more first tempo than against the team that are committing more. And that's why that's the like a game rhythm. It's really interesting this 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 kind of thing that you 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 have in you have there. After, uh, I'm talking a lot. It's like, no, just, the right, just the right amount. Yeah. Let's, let's go. Uh, chrono, chronology of the set or the game. I, I call it opening ceremony. Believe me or not, but while working against really big setters, I discovered that almost all of them, they like to start in some way. There are setters that are always starting with ball back or ball front or first tempo if they can. Almost every setter has some habit for the beginning of the game. So it's opening ceremony, but I'm watching always first four balls. First ball of, of the game, first ball of the set. Sometimes it's just one extra point when you can risk more than in the 2020. But you can go, you, can, you will know that the ball will be back in the first, first ball of this game. Set waves. It's according a little bit, like I told you about this, this example, this first tempo pipe. That there are players, they are starting in the first phase of the game, 
just installing some idea, but this is not main idea of the game. In the second part of the set, there is the real game, and that after 20, you have crunch time, yes, uh, Mark? You call it crunch time. Yeah, uh, crunch time that we have programmed is uh, both teams over 18. So 18, 17 is not crunch time, but 19, 18 is crunch time. And difference of two. Okay, yeah, of course. But, but we, have the, we have the possibility to a different uh, option to choose any part of the set and any, um, any different margin uh, with, the, with the score. So mm -hmm. you can play around with a lot of things. I'm not happy with my idea in this case because I, I divide only like three phases of the game. A, B, C. A is to 10, B is to 20, and over 20 is, is your crunch time, let's say. Plus extra analyze is CX, which I call it CX. It's a red zone from, from volumetrics, let's say. It's, but I'm not a red zone. I think it's different. But it's a setter balls. Set ball, sorry, 24, 23, and then. Then it's just money time player. So I'm, I have extra, extra point also when, when I'm watching this, this moment of the, of the game and of set and tie break. There are also setters, they are changing all the time set, set by set ideas which is also important to know that first set, for example, in first set they will use more call one, in second call seven. So I'm, we are also watching, I'm also watching this kind of thing that set by set can be, can be some change of idea. Finally, every setter has his main ball. He likes to set what kind, some kind of ball. So it means that he has also some main spiker, which he trusts more, his last option. And when there is a last option, we call it last option. Do you know that in these rotations, there is one player, let's, say, let's take Murillo in the last part of his career that he was in the court receiving but not spiking. We, everyone knows that there is a last option. I like to know if his, the setter is able to set two consecutive side outs to his last option. Because every now and once now, there is 10% of spike in this, in this rotation. Yes, but you have to wait for this one ball and then you can use option next time or consecutive rotation. So I'm asking always that, like, if last option is able to spike two consecutive times, two consecutive times, or three consecutive times. If not, immediately after his spike, we can react well. Set killers, it's, I think everyone is doing these things that who is, his, is the most important player to, to spike the, the most important balls and tie break, tie break players. I'm always analyzing, I always analyze really deeply tie break, what is going on in this, this specific moment. Uh, last point is double change, double substitution which is really important to me because if we go a little, little bit more deeper in the philosophy of the game is that every setter has a time to create his own strategy. When there is a double substitution, setter is going, coming inside the, uh, the court for three side outs in theory. And the, the pressure is really high. He has to play the best volleyball he, uh, he can play. There is no time to, pre to prepare tactic. So there are really, really big tendencies uh, in this case. More you have not experienced setters in this double change, then more, more easier is to find the answer which will be the first set. If, if there is no experience, it will be always ball back or ball front. And the, the last question is the first tempo pipe, if he's able to play or not. So this is the 22 points that we are we have connected in one PDA file or many PDA files with many rotations, variations, which means that what is going on in P5 when there is reception from one after 20. This big file is giving, you, giving us many, many informations and then we are taking the most, the key, info, the key, new, uh, key points, right? And 
why we did decide to to prepare this this kind of worksheets if you are if you are in the normal club and you have seven days to work to prepare your your tactic for the game it's easy you can study you can watch the game but mark you know exactly that if you go to play world cup you have sometimes six hours to to prepare one another opponent so you have to use this kind of protocols to get some specific information because then there is no chance there is no yeah. chance to find. so this these worksheets this all pdf files that we have this is just a help to find the correct answer how set, setter is playing as i said being a scout man i was seeing completely different volleyball being a coach completely different way and i had a i had a big big lucky that i in the beginning on the beginning of the my career i was working with daniel castellani and he said to me be be aware because there is a, a scoutman disease you will see numbers not play, not game and from this moment i was really watching the game not numbers which means that i was i was always doubting my my scouting skills question uh, question on my question Oh, asking myself, Question. yeah, asking myself if this is game rhythm, game rhythm scout file, or is just this number? It's just numbers. So we now we can start. We can open discussion. This is the, right. the first first uh, question, Oscar. Yeah. Can you um, can you send me a copy of one of those PDFs so I can uh, I can put it up with the recording? Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, my internet is terrible. Um, we've got a couple of questions that have come in. Uh, yeah, yeah, we're going to get into some details here, I can tell. <laughs> can, can I uh, send you by uh, WhatsApp? Yeah, sure, whatever, whatever works. Um, okay, so we got Rodrigo, who was the first to, to, to get us some questions. Um, so he says, this is a good article to complement what you're saying about the setter decision-making. Hitter's availability is always the first item for K1 and K2, and the opponent's blocking is also important. From rally to rally, with or without success, the setters don't usually repeat the set, but they keep the call. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, if they, let's let's check me because I I'm not sure if I understood well. well that's interesting. Uh, and it's not the exact question. Can you repeat it? Because I uh, really I didn't understand well the question. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, Oscar. I'm not sure I understand exactly either. Uh, well, maybe we can get Rodrigo. On. Uh, no, uh, yeah, you're still on here. See if, uh, see if you can clarify the question, because I'm, I'm actually a little bit confused as well. Um, one, uh, all right, we'll push, we'll push off from there. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. One, of the, one, one thing that comes to my mind on that, uh, the topic of what happens in the series when the setter, uh, what happens in a series, a service series, is one thing I watch for is if they change the first tempo call in the series that's normally uh if they keep the same call call then they're not giving very much away but if they change the call from one to seven it's normally a, a giveaway that they're about to do something they have a plan in mind so if a set of the changes from one to seven in a series that's that's always a that's always a really good thing Seven to one, but he's not giving too much away there. But one to seven is is a big difference. I agree. It's if they are changing setter call it means they have like safety button call to to play some. Yeah. There is a reason to to play. It. Actually, if I would like to say my opinion, I saw many many different ways to analyze numbers of repetitions. Mm -hmm. But I never trust them 100%. I need to watch every kind of situation because every situation is completely different. 
because if you really if you if you if you want to really uh, believe on the numbers you have to find a way that there is three consecutive side outs with exactly the same pass or exactly the same block or exactly the same uh, conditions like a point score point i don't believe on this i have to watch and i have to have sensation that this setter likes tends to repeat or tends to repeat with this specific player and after the after if you watch the the numbers and there is for example 30 percent of repeti repetitions and 70 no what kind of answer do you have one times yes one times no one time no so i have to watch i have to feel it if that's why i, I said that i'm i was really focused when i was scouting to find an answer how to scout the game rhythm and to have a correct specific numbers but it's really difficult for me for now i always i'm coming back to video and i have to watch it yeah that in a nutshell is um is why i read most of the time <laughs> because once you once you dig down into the numbers the more one thing is the more you dig the smaller the sample size so you have a crunch time in 25 matches. You have 25 matches analyzed from one setter, and in each rotation, he has 10 crunch times. So what, the, what does that mean when he has three crunch times in December, he has uh, four in January, but there was the first opposite was injured, and then one in March, and none in April, and then something different. So the this is one thing with the, the the really big data sets that it's easy to find things but maybe harder to find things with meaning and i love playing with it i love the numbers i started when i was a little kid i was collecting the numbers so in in other sports I, my first sport was cricket and in cricket you write down everything that happens for six hours so this was how I, I started. So I love the numbers, but the, the more I go, the, the video, the video is really important and what the mirror blocker, what the, the blockers are feeling in the, in the time also. There's always a question, what kind of coach you want to be in, in the case of, of, let's say, breakpoint? You want to risk? You want to read? It's it's always and you have to you have to find a way what you want to analyze in which way. Yeah. I had a really really big experience with one coach where we were playing almost all the time like a option system. That doesn't mean it's a commit every time for a first tempo against for a middle blocker. Yeah, sometimes left, sometimes sometimes left, sometimes right, sometimes double option. And yeah. I I loved it. But after that, after that, I start to think maybe it's too much because we are not developing our players. We are just making them, them machines. And when this coach was needed, there was another coach next to the player. He doesn't understand uh, volleyball. So in this case, I love to play options. In Switzerland, we play a lot of times. But also we have to understand that I was working 10 years with against many really top level setters. Many times I have an idea how they play, but sometimes I don't. And I have to prepare plan B. So for, the, for me, the most important thing is to create the correct system for the level of the competition that if you, are, you don't know if it's correct to go option four, option two, you play your system. After, yes. one, yeah, you do you agree? Yes, hundred percent. So, so in this case, I'm just looking some kind of informations that, in some specific moments, I can use comet. For example, I, I know that after timeout there will be a best player back. As I forgot to say that I am also analyzing that what is setter is doing after timeout called by his coach. This is all video challenge. This is also another thing, but it's a small detail. I'm never going too much inside. But in generally, I'm looking at this first ball, double substitution, the moments that I have really, really good 
I'm sure that I can make an option. I'm, I'm able to risk more in second side out, third side out, than in the first side out. But I have well, to... I have one question. Uh, about, about this, uh, I have one question about, um, for me, the biggest, the, the difference, or there is a connection between the information and the play. So the less information the players have, the less important is the communication. Exactly. So if you have a lot of uh, rules for committing or situations for committing, is that situations that the players memorize or they get a call from the bench? Call from the bench. In the moment that we were playing like, like a lot of options, and of course, the coaches that I used to work and me also, me, me either, is that if player is showing or telling me I will commit or I will go to position four, I always say, if you believe on it, let's go. But if there is a, like a normal situation, there was a call from the bench and we have a specific yeah. system what to do. And there was a really simple way to make them out to players understand what they have to do. It was like, like a five different things for each player. So it was the, it was you do, you, you do this, you do this, you do this. But there was a one missing thing that finally I understood that we, when we are talking with middle block, uh, with the block line, then mm -hmm. different line, they don't know what to do. There is no time to create, to talk with all these players, what is going on. So that yeah. was a missing factor, let's okay. say. Yeah, there's the added complication when you do the serve, when you want to serve, to have a, an um, offensive outcome where you see one matched up and you have to communicate with the server, but there's not time to communicate with the block. Exactly. Exactly. Yes, yes, yes. And for example, about the ball back, because there is, uh, let's say, the, one of the biggest tendencies with setters is that if you serve to the line on in one, the ball comes from back, many, many setters, they have technique. Uh, problems to do something or ball back or ball front yeah one year i was studying that i was not taking the numbers from zone one i was i was signing ball is coming from back because there is a difference between ball for in p4 p5 for center yeah. and for example p2 actually there is no ball back from coming from back because he's yeah. in the corner and the ball is always in front of him so I was always, or P1 also, yeah. so I was uh, always signing the ball, ball coming from back. And then there were, there were many really nice, interesting uh, uh, informations, but players, they don't understand it. There you need one year to explain what is ball back or ball coming from one. Yeah. And there was a big misunderstanding between us because we, the, Every time I saw exactly what I said, but when the ball was coming from back, the ball was front all the time. But there is misunderstanding between me scouting and the player being in the court. Let, let me ask you guys something and, on that okay. on that positioning. Um, obviously, it's it's pretty important to look at tendencies in terms of where the set goes based on where they're taking the ball from. But what about the tempo of those sets? And I, and I bring this up because I, I had a specific situation back when I coached at Brown. One season when we were going against Yale, their setter had a really clear pattern where if the ball was in front of her, she was coming from, from a five or six, she would zip the ball outside, fast tempo. Not necessarily on a, on a different tempo call, but just her sets were faster on those passes than if the ball was coming from one. They would, even if she's still setting the ball to four, everything else is the same. That ball to four was still slower when she was taking a ball from one than if she was taking five or six. And it was something that we could, okay, you know, when in doubt, we're going to send the ball to one because it gives our block more time to, to set up on the defense and all that. Um, just wondering if, if you guys, if you've seen anything like that in your own analysis. Mark, you have more experience? 
Uh, I missed the 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 you froze John froze when he when we got to zip the ball to position four. So I didn't get the I didn't get the second part of that. I I, w I would like to turn a little bit your question to my my situation, which is a bit the same. I, I think similar. Sometimes I'm, I was using the the short service to two to push the set opposite setter to ball to play front. But there was my the, the, uh, my setter, the worst one. So we have to also find a way to understand that what you said is completely, but more, more coming from video that you can see that the speed of the ball or quality of the ball from this kind of situation. For example, you set to ball, you set ball, uh, served ball to one, and the ball is coming from one and the ball front is not so the same like coming from five. This, this you have to see on video but then you can adapt to your tactic. Because finally I realized many times that I'm pushing the opponent team to playing against my weakest blocker. Right. Yeah, it was definitely video. Played. Definitely video. Definitely video. And what, this is what, what we can also connect, is that many times happen that you have many, uh, many uh, in database, like you, you will share it, this, this video PDA file, like, or you will take it just and send after, uh, John. Uh, I, I'll I'll post it when I when I upload the video. I'll post okay. it with the video. Okay. So the, I would like to ex to make a little, just one to say one thing. That first is tendency. That you see that for example there's seven over seven. But there is one. Let's say efficiency of the over seven is zero, or ten percent. And it coming, it's, coming, it's coming from numbers. So there is no point to, to think too much about over seven because this is not efficient game, not, not efficient play. So the, then, because we are always talking about the, the, how to study setter, first you have to adapt to his quali your quality of the team, but you have to also see what they can do and take correct decision. That's the most important. We are studying that, for example, base code seven, there is you can, there are three different kind of situations. You can stay in the middle of the court with middle blocker, make one step, or commit, let's say. And if you see the numbers that over seven is not efficient, efficient ball, you can take some decision. Or you jump always, you are committing always to the first tempo, or you commit with position two in block. There's always, according to your tactic, what you want to do. So sometimes, what you ask me about this coming ball from five or one, the different ball, it's also connected, correlated with the efficiency of the spike. Sometimes you don't have to watch video. The numbers will give you an answer. <laughs> John? Okay. Yes. Yep. We lost. Uh, let's get to some of these questions. Because they're they're starting to pile up. All right, so let's start with the first one. We have a lot of details. How many of them do we give to players? You sort of touched on that, but uh, any additional thoughts on on that question? To be honest, I have problems to understand your questions. Repeat again. <laughs> All right. There's a lot of detail in your scouting report, obviously. Yeah. How much of that do you actually present to the players versus how much do you keep to yourself, maybe use situationally? So, sorry, John, but sometimes you're skipping and then I'm missing the idea. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Yeah. Connection is not great all the time. So the, the question is, uh, how much do you give the players? Just few informations. The key important informations. I'm, I... First, I start to that I have to give three informations, key key informations. Now I'm giving the most important informations. If there are four, I'm, I'm giving four. If there are one, there is one key information. I'm giving one. I don't want to to make a book that to feel that I'm a good coach and I do great my job. I want that my my players uh, feels really comfortable on the court, and then during the game, I'm giving them more examples, more informations. Sometimes connecting with the options. That, for example, if 
I'm talking to the, the server, go short, then I'm going comment. Because this is, my, this is the information that I underline on my, my image report that is, is important, but not so important for, the, for middle blockers. There are many middle blockers that they give a list of the things, but finally they do all what, they, what they used to do. It's a habit, it's a technique. So I'm, I'm tending to, I, I prefer to give them three, four informations about the setup. The key points for me always are how many, per, from where and when they play first tempo. That's the first, first my, my, my intention. Uh, from where and when they plan for first tempo. Second, connected pipe. Do, should we expect pipe or not? In Switzerland, I'm, I'm now in the easiest league that there are maybe two league teams that are really play pipe. They, re they do play pipe, but in general they don't. So I'm really focused about where, from where and when, and what kind of ball. Second is R2, R4. That's always something special. Do we, should we follow? Should we not follow? We should we stay? We should commit? We should help? There is a really ball, for example, if the ball is to, to zone two and they are playing really fast ball back, that's for me information that I have to say to my, to my outside hitter, don't wait, don't wait, don't help. You have to go one-on-one -on -one with this kind of ball. And the last, uh, um, last thing is I am like to say always about P1, rotation one, or some specific rotation they, they are struggle, uh, struggling a lot. That's the four points that I, I really like to say. So you don't give the you don't give the distribution by rotations? Often no. Mostly I'm dividing mostly I'm dividing if there's something special, what is going on when the setter is setter is front or setter is back. Opposite front or opposite back. I don't like it. Players I'm I work with I think more you work more, but I think 300 players, and sometimes they don't even know which kind of rotation they have on the other side. So they're giving their rotations, like rotation by rotation, I don't, I don't trust on it because the general numbers are really clear sometimes, but rotations before something happened specific and mm -hmm. everything is changing. The whole yep. climate is changing. So I don't like go rotation by rotation. I had... Uh especially players who uh, spend time in America, American players, they want to have the rotation by rotation. And I always had fights with them because I would never give the rotation by rotation. So, mm. The P1, often, because P1 is, such a, is so different, but when uh, the other rotations, most of the time is somewhere between 25 and 40 in each wrote a percentage for each position and you have between 25 and 40 that can change that's a big change from game to game to have this you know exactly. this is, it means that he can set more or less everything from game to game depending on the last rotation depending on the on the score which is uh, one of simon's questions yes uh, you know, i was just going to say that yeah simon, yeah simon wants basically wants to know how do you how do you pick which matches are used for your scouting and are there any objective reasons for that? The, uh, I, I, I'll answer one. Um, the, the main thing is the most recent matches. So the, the rule has always been or was always in the past the last four matches, three or four or five, depending on, on who the coach is. Now, because we have the opportunity to collect a lot more video and um, and analyze a lot more data we can have so by the time you get to the playoffs and you play in the semi-finals you have you can have 30 games worth of data um but the focus is on the last is on the la on the closest matches so um all the most recent matches my english isn't my english isn't so good so uh, and uh, my point of view is like when when we used to work we were trying to scout all games during all season. And then we were looking for specific games, but like you said, Mark, most of the time, the last four or five games are more important. What I really like to do, and uh, 
it work really well is to if you have a possibility I, in switzerland i haven't got this kind of possibility but if you find a way to if you find a team which has more or less the same characteristic like you have for example you had masne and you had a bocic yeah. like in block yeah. I, yeah, was yeah, yeah, always, yeah. I was always looking the teams similar like me. For example, you can take Zaks in this case, yeah. Tonyuti and Big Blocker. And then watching what Setter is going to do with this kind of teams. Because if yeah. you are mixing all styles of volleyball, then you are going too much inside. But many years ago we were we had the team like Tonyuti, Setter, and Konarski, one of the best outside, opposite in the block, one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. We, we found the, the team, like Warsaw, in this, game, in this case, it was Philip in block. And uh, I don't remember now the, the Setter name, but it was, Zagumne was injured, there was a second, call, a second uh, Setter. Fair like. Fair like. Mm -hmm. Fair exactly. Like. Yes, exactly. So it was a completely the same. The, the, we, we are matching the same way the, the category of the blockers, and we love to watch more one game than five games, because this is the re, our reality. And if there is a setter who has tendency to play against block, first first you you will say, ah, I have Tonyuti in block, so everybody will play all the time Tonyuti. It's not like this. Setters they are using yeah. Tonyuti in specific moment, on in yeah. transition or or which using some specific call. So if you find the team in the same blocker like you have, then you can really analyze correct way, in correct what they do with this kind of of the team. If I can go back to uh, Simon's question that you've deleted now, John, just the Simon made the. The point that Just answer not to leave it. Ah, uh, so yeah, it's okay. Um, that there's a big difference between twenty percent and fifty percent in the distribution from game to game, and the point is that is actually not a big difference because if you have a three set match and uh, in men's volleyball a three set match with strong serving, uh, you have a rotation with one strong server who serves. 20%, 15% aces and 25% errors, and you might have six, uh, a sample size of six for one match. So the difference between 20% and 50% is the difference between two and three, basically. So it's, it's only a difference of one ball in a match that, that makes a big difference in the percentage. And that's, uh, uh, that's, that's one of the things. But when we look at, and Oscar mentioned it, when you look at the, the distribution percentages game by game, and what you tend, what you end up seeing is that there's a there's a few zeros and a few hundreds in each position because the just because of what I just explained, and so if you see some zeros and hundreds, you know that the setter can change a lot from game to game. But if you see a lot around a certain range, so that he's always between. 30 and 50 percent setting first tempo, you can say, okay, this is this is something that's a little bit more consistent. And all of those things are why we don't look very much at the distribution. Yeah, I was gonna say, can you pull up an example on the app just to show people? Um, and while while you're doing that, I'll ask this question from Miguel for Oscar. Uh, it's, you, t you take into consideration first, second, third options inside out, but do you take in into consideration uh, what happens within the same rally? So, for example, setter sets the ball to a hitter who recycles it off to the block. Yeah. What does the setter then do after that? I take consider, but looking always the most simple situation that we can find. For example, if there is a spike from first tempo, and they do, they dig the ball to nine ten meters, and they are giving us free ball. I'm looking for the answer. It will be first tempo again, or it will be pipe. Well, oh Mark, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, don't worry. Keep going. Uh, so, 
we can go. I, I understood after many, many years that every, every single rally we can explain, we can, we can set this, decide one story about the game. Being by rally, by rally, every single rally has a story. And you can talk about it a lot of times. But then you have to, to squeeze all kinds of information that the players can use during the game. So if I said to that, for example, after cover, there will be always ball four, there is no time to, this, to decide, to take a, like a tactic decision. They read the game. So we cannot say too much about that. So I'm, what, what I'm preferring is he repeats to the same player if he has perfect condition, which means it's an after free ball pass. Don't go too, too much inside because then you, you make use, your, you as a coach, really satisfied. I gave thousands of information and you will be really frustrated after because set middle docker or outside hitter will not remember it. It's impossible. It's impossible. Uh, we were working and all these kind of studies that I show you, or I told more, I told about it, and the, I had the feedback from the court that sometimes you are going too much and the players, they don't know it. And this is not of lack of the of quality of the players. It's too much. There is a game that they have to take a million decisions. So to, as much simple you can, you can describe volleyball and you what you want, then it's easier. I agree with that. Uh, you can see um, the screen. Uh, be before, yeah, I was going to say before. Yeah, we can see the screen. Just as a setup. Um, there's a much bigger discussion of this application and all of the tools that are built into it in the conversation we had with Mark and Ben a few weeks back on analytics. So we don't need to go too far in the weeds in terms of that. But carry on, Mark. Uh, this is just the basic thing that we were talking about. This is the data set doesn't matter. But um, this is the rotation. And I just did a quick one uh, by rotation, good reception after good reception, and each one of these dots represents one match, and the, the number on the side is the distribution in, in one match, and so you can see Seto in position one, basically 162 uh, possibilities, and there's a lot of zeros, there's a few, this is, uh, sorry, uh, this is first tempo, so there are some matches where the Seto set 100% first tempo, a few more matches where he said zero and uh, so on and so forth. So, um, and you can, so once where the, the, the concentration is small, so maybe something like this, we can, maybe we can start to say something serious that, uh, you know, between 20 and 50%, 25 and 50% distribution to position two, uh, one in that, scenario so um, but the range here is what I is what I was saying is the reason that uh, that I don't spend a lot of time on distribution per rotation because the difference between from game to game is really different if I would okay. say if I can say something I I would like to see this kind of analy analysis going by how uh, by middle blockers in front Outside hitters in, in front and opposites in front. This this would be more interesting. Or opposite for first line uh, and back line, the back row. That would be more interesting to me. Uh, you mean your op the opposite of this team or the opposite of your team? Scouting team. Which means that uh, because now you can you have six rotations and there are many informations. But you can take for example you have. Uh, Nehemiah Mote in front. And I would like to know yeah. a redistribution distribution around him, like this one. One court. One this yeah, yeah. in this case I would like I, I would see in which games the he spikes more, in which games he sp spikes less. That will be more interesting information to me. And then I'll ask him oh, yeah. like, why. Why he right. like this. I've, I've mentioned this to Ben, and I'll uh, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll pass Put it. Ben on it. 
Yeah, that one's actually that one's actually a little bit more difficult to to pick the which player is front row at any time. But. <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. Yeah. All right. Okay, we've got a, a question from Chris, uh, who wants to know: Some scout men analyze reception slash setter position on court. Others look at uh, reception and setter movement on court. So two step forward, four step forward. So I can say a lot about it. It's a scoutman disease. <laughs> it's, it's all about that when I was 10 years ago, the scouting game, sometimes I was stopping rewinding, stopping, watching, rewinding, uh, maybe it's zone four, maybe it's middle, maybe it's a bit between this. And I was really, I was really focused about to not make mistake. After 10 years, I know that if I have a big doubt, watching five times the same situation on video, how can I expect that my middle blocker or my position to block in block will understand better than me? in one second. So after 10 years, my experience is if there is a really clear ball to zone four and there are four steps forward, for example, I don't count steps, but you can see that for setter is a not comfortable position and he has to run. This is the clear signal also for your line in block. Of course, we can talk when there is a border line and something like that, but if there is a Different, small difference between zone three, zone four, zone three, zone two. There's always zone three because they don't have time to to analyze like we scoutmen do. It, as much simple scout analyze you will do, then it's easier to put it in the court. The uh, one there are two there are two classic ones. One is the reception off the net. What does it mean reception off the net? It's really clear from the video, but when the set, when the the middle is watching the watching the setter, what's a, what's a jump? What's a step? What's two steps? And the other one is what's uh, moving back. So sometimes it, it's really clear in the video that it's one whole step back, but it's not, you know, it's not what the the player reads. So it's uh, it's not only I still do the same thing. Because the scout has to. Um, <laughs> uh, just uh, we got some clarification from Rodrigo, and I actually sent the file to both of you. Um, he was referring to an academic article that did a questionnaire of, of setters in terms of what they're thinking about in their decision making. So I'll post that. It's a PDF. I'll post that when I upload the video along with uh, Oscar's distribution, which is featuring uh, Uriarty. Um, so just. To clear that up, um, Simon has a question here. What assumptions slash results do you sometimes check for statistical significance? I never run statistical tests on any of the data that I collect for the game. So, I mean, I, yeah. I the end, the, the result, the what we're aiming for is a practical, is a usable result. So um, we'll look at the video, like Oscar says. We'll say, okay, forty is forty percent is something or something not based on the video. And um, in practice, in the heat of the game, which we've talked, which we've talked about a few times now, whether something is statistically valid uh, is not. It's not really helpful. No, I'm agree. Well, now we, if I, if I would address that question. partly by by what we've already talked in terms of you know, yeah, yeah. You, know, you I mean, I think it was it was probably a little bit motivated by just looking at the graphs as we did. Um, there is yeah. there is a certain amount of that would is Mark's not doing an actual analysis of of significance, but he is considering it when he's looking at things like the distributions and going, okay, does this 
does this look like it's it's a legitimate result or does it look like it's you know subject to random variation and the sense. yeah and actually one thing that i'll add to um uh to oscar's big list of things is uh and he did actually talk about this is in one section is the combinations of things so sometimes things are not by themselves don't show anything but when you start to get into some combinations and that's where the app is i don't want to be a salesman but that's where the app is really good because you can you can go backwards and forwards and try different things um and the the one one example is the setter the, the setter who uh when he moved backwards he set either first tempo or uh, uh, he said either first tempo or back. So he said, okay, first tempo or back, that's something. But then I actually checked whether the set of call was one or seven. And then you stay instead of 50, 50, it was a hundred and a hundred because when the set of call, when the setter ran close to the setter and he moved back, he set the first tempo because there was a steam where the, the blocker was moving. And when the setter call was seven and the setter, the middle blocker was running right at the opposing middle, then he set the short distance because he knew that was one on one. So there are, there are other combinations of things that when you start to play around that you can see um, and, you know, then it's not a, it's not a science, even if we use a lot of numbers that sound like they're interesting. Sorry, all the numbers are interesting that sound like they're important. I have one, one story. It's coming from finals of Champions League. I don't, I, want, I don't want to say which coach, which team, but there is a big story that the team was preparing for this Champions League final for many, many weeks. They had them 10 sessions of video. And after the 10th session, one of the players came to me and he said, so our preparation looks like this. This is the main strategy of the setter. But over this, there is a really important rule. When happens something, then the, this first rule doesn't work. And, but then you have another super extra important rule, which is most important of these three. But then most the important is this one. And he was confused. And sometimes we are going to also, like, like you said, combinations are the most important thing in this case. Because sometimes it's happening that you have to check and to not go to the trap that you say there is a service, uh, if you serve to zone one, the setter is, never, setter is never setting ball back. But in the same case, you are checking that in P6, P5, or P6, there is only ball back. And you are going in your own, your own trap because no, in before nobody served to one in CP6. And you serve to P6 in P6 to zone one and the ball is back and everybody's watching you. What, what the hell is going on? <laughs> so you have to combine all these kind of things to give specific information. You, that's why I, I really like connections. And uh, I work with Stefan Antiga. He was really good reader of, he was really good in reading of the game. He was looking more than, with this middle blocker, doesn't work pipe. Or with this middle blocker, seven over is really difficult to play. Because he's jumping so high, then, then over the trajectory over him, then will be too slow, then they cannot play it. And in, after 10 years, I'm watching more that, that kind of, of situation on the court. So it will be more difficult to play. Not, not even the numbers is saying, are saying something. That it's a specific situation on the court, they, they design the play. So if you will have, I don't know, Lizinach, they play over seven over Lizinach, but that he's jumping like this, over seven will be really difficult to play fast yeah. because he will cut this ball. So then I can help. That's, that's for me the, the key answer for after 10 years of, of scouting. And I'm looking like this, or more watching which middle blocker is in front and what's happening around him or which outside hitter is in front. That's the most important for me to, to me to, for, for after these 10 years. All right. Uh, 
Okay. We've got a question about when you're actually in the game. Is there anything that you can do in scouting the setter live to help your, your blockers out? The, um, the video and the game are two completely different things. And uh, one question that I wanted to ask Oscar at one point but we got sidetracked was how do you account for the difference in what the set looks like on the video and what it's re like in real life? Uh, I, I've been, I, I haven't been caught out for a while, but I've definitely been caught out before with the set looks much slower in real life. Uh, sorry, on the video. The compression of the video and the screen and whatever and you've come and uh, you, in your gym, everything's super fast. You watch the video and they say, these guys play high balls. I can't believe it. And I've been caught out more than once when I was a young coach by saying, these guys play really slow. So we have time, blah, blah. And it's not like that at all. <laughs> so that's, that's one thing. I don't ever say they play really slow anymore. Um, but the, what happens in the in the game like you the video doesn't the video is taken from a long way away so it's at least 15 meters away from the uh from the setter sometimes more from a different angle and i actually think it's really important to see a setter live and it's actually important to play against a setter to really understand him you, i don't think that it's It's very difficult, put it that way. It's very difficult to really understand a setter until you've actually stood on the other side of the court from him. And I've had many situations where I've had a detailed match plan and threw it out in the first five points of a set because I said, okay, this is not... Um, none of this is important because I know exactly what this guy is going to do now. So um, there are examples of guys who were scared to set certain balls and you can see when you're standing there that they can't set a certain ball because they just can't, they're scared of setting it. It's the bizarrest thing I've ever seen. And um, especially because this guy makes hundreds of thousands of dollars being a setter. Um, but you can you can see those, those kinds of things and you have to be prepared to... Um, change everything in the first technical timeout or the or the first timeout first point is that uh, what you said about this trajectory and the velocity of the speed uh, of the set i have once that one i was watching once game of blues liga in in home and tv and with all audio and all volume of the of the audience and i said wow that's the really important moment of the game because i could feel it yeah, I felt like I'm I'm inside the court on the sport hall, and it was like a, you know this moment was a key moment. So the the stadium was in fire, you know everything was, you know, really important. And I signed it on the paper. Watch this action, this moment of the on on video. Like you get collect video from a data project or the volumetrics, and mm -hmm. then I realized that watching game without audio you are cutting one really important emotions. You cannot read the emotions, for, the, for example, for the setter and the, the weight, weight of, the, of the moment. You are just going inside the numbers. Ah, oh, it's 2020. Yes, but 2020 sometimes is like 15-15 in tie break. Yeah. And if you watch the game without audio, you, you are cutting really important factor. So I try to always watch game now with audio, but like you said, that we are converting video, we are converting video, and then also quality is not so not so good. But I'm trying to also understand the moment by hearing. Yeah. Du during the game, is that I don't like to crown start not prepared. No, no, have, no, no, no. Uh, it's like we have to. It's all with all the things we do. It's just to be prepared. But tactic, like I said, it's a, like I said that set waves. Mm, uh, this is the current of, of the of the river it's changing all the time and you can expect sometimes like you said even after first time out i 
after one really I said, ah, oh, no, they won't play like this. Because I didn't think about one thing that now I saw immediately. And as I'm changing immediately, ah, come on, no, they won't play like this. They won't. So, and I, I don't say that I'm good. I'm super. Sometimes I'm, I'm in, in, sometimes I'm out. But the, the uh, system of the game, you have to first you start from something and then just compare it. Because if you are start to write, ah, in R2 now he said ball front, now back. It's too late. You are two steps back against your opponent setter. But if you say, ah, he's not playing long side, and then three times he played, then you start to think, ah, why he plays this game? That's the, the way that I'm thinking during the game. I'm trying also to, uh, this year I, I couldn't ask my, my um, staff. But in general, inside the team, like we have a national team, we are dividing this kind of things also, understand the changes on the, during the game, understand what, why they play that, like this, or why don't they don't play like this. That's really important. Not constantly go like, ah, oh, the numbers are 70%, so we are, for sure we'll be there. Mark, I can totally appreciate your comments about the video. And uh, early early career analysis and thinking everything's slow until you watch them live. It's just, yeah, yeah it's a, that was a, definitely a lesson learned. Simon's asking if you'd ever tried watching on a nine-meter wide screen, see if that would be real-time speed. <laughs> <laughs> My guess is... You had, you had a pretty big screen at Berlin. Yeah, we didn't use that for... We didn't use that for scouting. What did you see? You saw us in the stadium, in the big stadium. I don't know. Or in the training gym. Yeah, in the hollow, yeah. No, no, I, I saw you match smelling. Because uh, we, because in, in Berlin, I had a video set up during practice, and in the, in the practice gym, we had a projector playing it on a wall, and in the main stadium, we used the LED scoreboard. So, um, and in Yashembia, also, we used the LED scoreboard for practice. But analyzing the game, you are going to in the in your bus, yeah. laptop, and it's yeah. you're you on your laptop. <laughs> I haven't I haven't actually thought about scouting the game on the from the LED screen. That would be that would be a funny picture. But by uh, uh, according to what you said about the speed of the of the set, there is one let's say way to check how fast the ball is to measure the con yes exactly chrono. Yeah. From mm -hmm. the starting position, from the first touch till the spike uh, of the, the touch of the spiker, and actually, that was really interesting to me. Also, to why we use this com commit system in Poland with Stefan, that we always we the first question we ask ourselves was how fast the set is. We measured our middle blockers in the read way, read mode, that for that the from the starting position, from the moment of the release of the ball, how much time our middle blocker needs to arrive to, to over the net. And the medium, media was, um, average was 1.2, let's say. One was 1, 1 1.2. Mm -hmm. From reading, when you read. Yeah. For example, Maruf, from even from six meters, he was setting ball back 0.6. Okay. So we said there is no chance to arrive from reading position the correct proper uh, stable block. Then we can use we have to use options. Yeah. That's the the, the point the, of reference that maybe you are able to, if you have really fast blockers read really reading uh, really well the game and the set on, on the other side is not so fast then you don't have to use options. You just read. But what happens when you have Konarski back and all balls are like this? Then you have to decide what to do in the block. That's the starting position that I'm, I'm not doing in on Switzerland, but if I start again working with national teams then I will or high-level clubs, that will be really interesting to point of reference. When exactly use options according to the velocity of the speed. Of the of the set, sorry. Very good. 
Um, any more questions uh, for the attendees? Let, let me know. Uh, type them in. Um, anything that we haven't touched on or any thoughts you guys would like to get out there before we finish up? I would like to say that finally, 10 years on international level scouting, I think six, no, no, 2000 games, I think for sure I, I did the scout. Now I'm working on this. That's my, my <laughs> data <for me>. <laughs> <laughs> But first I'm watching game, just making some simple scout. And if I have some questions, then I'm going to the numbers. Before I was watching numbers and then to video. Now I'm completely different way as a coach. Mark, anything from you? Uh, no, I don't really have. I don't really have anything to add other than other than that was really interesting. So I have my pen and paper and notes. So yeah, I feel it's good. Using uh, some of Vital Heinen's old uh, match plans. If anybody wants to see a Vital Heinen match plan, uh, I would like you to can't see put that. that out there without the answer is uh, going to be yes. It's Turkey 2013, so I don't think that uh, ah, this kind of I, I saw already. This this more or less the same period I saw already. Yeah, the A5, 15 pages. Does he still do that in Poland? I don't know. No, 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 no. The, yeah, yeah, he will stay. Yes. No, no, I mean uh, ah, the presentation. The printout. I don't know. What I've heard is now working only in starting lineup. It's just starting six. Oh, the opponent. Yeah, he yeah. only he only gives the information. Even then, I worked with him in 2013, and he only gave the information of the starting lineup. He said he has everything else, but he uh, he doesn't want to make everything complicated. So right. I, I can say also that I prepare like a PowerPoint presentation uh, for this one. I, will, I can share you also, John. There are all these informations like written. I had one question. If you have all of these options that you use during the game that are signal from the bench, the, uh, do you tell the players before the match what they all are? They always, they are always the same. No, no, I mean uh, the situations. So we in, so that they are prepared at 2020, there will be something or the third ball in no. the series or... No. No, they just look every time to the bench and they have the option and they go. It's, it works it work like this. It works like this. That uh, every player has his specific code. I don't want to say exactly what is it, code. And he, yeah. does, he knows what does it mean. So for yeah. the specific situation, like ball to four, it's it was written like in code. Yeah. But during the game, let's say crunch time, it was the information from the, from the bench. You yeah. this, you this, you this. And this was not on the paper? In it the, was, was on the paper. No, no okay. never. Never, because if you prepare this kind of things, that in 25, 25, the ball will, be go, will go to Mikhailov, yeah. then you have to change it because maybe you see that Mikhailov, this game has 20%. Or so so it's, yeah. this, this you have to confirm during the game. You have to confirm during the game. It's never like you are really sure. I spoke, I think, last week uh, with Daniel Castellani, and he said something really clear for me like uh, what setter has to do if you have let's say Mihailov on the back or Leon let's say let's say Leon our Polish outside hitter is that everybody knows that in 24 24 24 23 the ball will go there but the job of the setter is to to make some kind of doubt for the middle blocker maybe this time no and finally ball is there and the job, the, the work setter has to do is to, not, is to create some doubt situation. That middle yeah. blocker will be uh, late. And I think it's the perfect, like, uh, let's say, definition of role of setter. Everybody knows. I, we, 
Um, uh, we studied once during Final Four in Champions League, and we knew that Mikola Grbic, are after second set, is taking the numbers and say, oh, today there are two players playing good. So from the first set, we, the, he, oh, he will set only them, to them, to there. Well, so. <laughs> and in tiebreak, just two players spied. But one had yeah. 80 and one had, one had 100. And we never know which one, because it was one side, one side. And we never, one had 100, one second, one 80. And we lost this tiebreak. And we knew. And we knew. On the, I had the same, I have written, I think, this same idea from Castellani. Mm -hmm. And the best option, the best one that I ever saw was Vermilio for Kazan against Berhatov in uh, Final Four and was 17-15 in the fifth, something like this. And the last two side outs for, the last two side outs were with no block from Vermilio. One was to Mikhailov and somehow it was Plinsky and another, another really yeah. good middle. Sorry? Um, yeah, Mojdonek. Yeah, yeah, really good middles, and he some he organized the game somehow that at fifteen fourteen and sixteen fifteen, or whichever it was, he had uh, he had no block on the these, against Mikhailov. Yes, and for example, coming back to our conversation, is that we can study and analyze setter really really deep and really well, but if you play final of the Champions League. You don't have data for this one. You can watch just once. Maybe some setter will play that will be first time on, in his career that he's playing this kind of the game. This is also important. That you have to understand that the, rank, the weight of the game is completely different sometimes. There is a difference between playing against, I don't know, Bitgosh against Zaksa and Zaksa Scrap. It's also, if you, if you pick, if you want to know which kind of games you want to uh, really study you have to adapt to your situation so if you are playing if you are scouting in zaxa then take the games against Kra, Warsaw, warsaw or something like that not against like uh, the bottom of the league there, there is not the same game i have uh, i have a friend he's a tennis coach and he's one of the best tennis coaches in the world and he talks about this a lot and i'm he says with him the top players they play completely differently. So Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, they play completely differently at different against different opponents and different times of the match. So they and he said one the secret is to find what is the real crunch time. Mm. And I've been talking to him about this for one year and I can't think of the I can't figure out the volleyball equivalent for this so if you have some ideas yeah I, well it's, exactly. i mean you you, you the, the thing i would say to that mark is you probably know it in 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 real time because you you have a sense when you're standing there in the middle of a match like oh okay that was a that was an important point but it's not like you can necessarily you know flag that in the in the scout file well in tennis you can and if you can't in a, if you can't in volleyball, then the solution is reading. Yes. Okay. Uh, another thing that that I thought about was uh, was something that gets talked about with Bill Belichick, uh, coaching the Patriots. In that there, I don't know if, how true this is, or if this is just a perception, but there's the indication that sometimes he will call a play just to mess with the analytics of the other teams. <laughs> so to break a, a tendency that they know that they have um, so that when people go back and try to look at it later, it doesn't look quite so obvious. Or there's another option that they might think that they have to prepare for when, in fact, he probably will never use that play again. <laughs> so that's kind of that's a bit next level. <laughs> uh, Gerbich used to do that. I'm, Gerbich used to do that. He he never said first tempo in important moments, and he was famous in some point of his career 
I'm watching the old games from 97, and he sets first tempo from three metres. He's like a small blonde. But later in his career, he never played first tempo. But he all. But when you look at the when you look at it, it's at his distribution. It was always 35 percent somehow, more or less. And what he did was he said at the beginning of the set and when the set was won or lost. So when he was 17-22, he will set the next four ball, next four side outs, first tempo, and then was uh, was always like this. So. And it's, it's exactly what I'm looking for watching the video. Yeah. There, there, there are moments, like you said, 17-22, I'm not watching it. Even. I'm not writing in like... Like it's kind of important situation for me. I'm looking always the answers when the game is tight. It's 16, 16, 18, 18, 20, 20. What we, he will exactly play? Because there are di big difference between you are leading five points and the, the setter can be a little bit relaxed more and more open to play something that he's not sure. Uh, yeah. I'm, look, I'm always looking for the answer. Wh which kind of ball is in which kind of ball he's not sure and then I would I'm trying to use it against him yeah or push him to do it or it, or leave it and we go other option just like like semi option let's say half options sometimes overload four overload two but looking this kind of weaknesses let's say of the yeah. set yeah. okay there you go Shall we wrap it up there? We were, we were about to wrap up. We've got an extra 15 minutes, John. Bonus time for, the, for everybody. Yeah. Excellent customer service. All right. Well, thanks, Oscar. Thank you, Mark. Thank, Thank you. everybody for attending and for putting in the questions. I've got, like as I said, got Oscar's uh, PDFs. I'll post those. Plus the one that uh, uh, Rodrigo sent me on that paper. So the email will go out, and that will all be eventually available.